Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hi there, and welcome back to episode 107 of the Cognitive Podcast. We think I had something like 220 before I took that break for a few years. So really, welcome back. If you've been here before, glad you came back. If you heard the old series and wondered what happened to me, I'm here, and welcome back, but welcome back. I'm sitting at home today on a couch in the living room, on Monday, December 5th at 3.45 p.m. because Minerva has my chair and will not let me have it. And you can see a picture of her in the captain's chair at the top of the show notes, which happen to live at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com. Don't forget that C-O-G, the word knit, I-V-E, podcast.blogspot.com. Or you can go to our show notes on Ravelry, which I am working very hard to keep updated I would like to point out to you, and I owe an apology uh, to Ann Knit. Ann Knit wrote in and said, when are you actually dropping the podcast? I mean, I got the notes, but I can't find the real thing. Yes, um, that would be because I will do the notes as I'm recording, and then I tend to just publish them when I think they're done. And for me, there's no real reason to do that, to be honest. For me, it's just a way of saying, there you go, finished, and I'll put them on Ravelry, and I'll really do all the work I think I have to do. Pardon me. The real process is like this. So today I will record 107, and I will finish all the notes. Anything I mentioned that I didn't put in the notes, I'll add in, and I'll give it one final edit, and then I'll save it. And then I will go into HTML, and copy the whole thing, and I will move a copy of that to Ravelry in HTML, which will publish it in regular view for the rest of you. So now the notes are on Ravelry. Then I will go back into Blogger, into my account, and I will create a new note called Episode Next Episode. It's like Episode 108, since I'm working on 107 right now. And then I will copy the notes from 107 again, because it's like a template, you know, and I go through it taking out pictures and everything and leaving blank spaces so I know what I'll be working on on the next episode. So that's how that goes. Meanwhile, I finish the recording, and usually I record during my weekend, Sunday or Monday, and then on Thursday morning, usually but not always, I will do the final edit, and I will set up things. I will transfer to Libsyn and set it up to drop the podcast usually the following Saturday. So I'm recording today on a Monday. I will edit this again on a Thursday, and it will drop next Saturday. So if this is the 5th, it should drop on the 10th, on Saturday the 10th, well, Saturday, whatever that is. Meanwhile, the notes, I will finish the notes today, and I will set up the notes for my next episode, and I will also probably copy these notes today into Ravelry, so you will see them land there if you're paying attention. And I will publish these if I think they're finished, even today, even though it's only Monday and the actual episode won't drop until Saturday. Meanwhile, I will spend the rest of this week in between times adding things into the next episode because I will consider this episode in terms of content pretty much finished. So that's how it works. And mea culpa, I apologize, Ann Nip, because I left you sort of hanging there. But that's how it often works, and I try to schedule as I can. Since we're in the warm thanks, thank you, Anne, for that intelligent comment. Uh, Gail T., thank you uh, for showing me your Lady Eleanor. It's in the show notes for the rest of you on um, Blogspot. You should be wearing that, baby. It's gorgeous. And my love to your podcast knitting companion, Rosie. Sustainable Living, who does not have a G because she tells us there is a limit on your username in Ravelry. 
She has a podcast. Not surprisingly, it's called the Sustainable Living Podcast. She's on break. I would say that would be well worth listening to. I have been moving in that direction late in my life, which really makes me feel embarrassed and wonder why I didn't move to it earlier. So there's what I'm going to be looking into. Knit one, pug two. Ha 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 ha. I got you hooked on the Beatrice Hyde Claire books, didn't I? Yeah. I'm enjoying them. I'm enjoying them. In case you're wondering, yeah, of course the obvious does happen. They do get married. But you know that from the first novel. You know it's going to happen. It's amazing how long that author drags it out. I want to write romances someday. <laughs> if you hit, you get wealthy, but most of them don't hit, I'm afraid. In the meantime, if you look at our show notes, you will see a note for Yola Boca Flod. That's me trying to say Icelandic. This is the Icelandic tradition where on Christmas Eve, you give each other books and then everybody sits up all night reading their book and drinking hot cocoa. Why? Because I think the Icelanders have figured out that nobody sleeps well on Christmas Eve anyway. You might as well give them something productive to do. If I could give you any book for Christmas Eve, what would I give you? Well, first of all, I'm assuming that you celebrate Christmas or Yule. So if you're Islamic or Jewish or someone who doesn't celebrate those from some other faith, yeah, it's going to kind of knock this right out. So my generic book for people who celebrate it would probably be A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. For the simple reason, it's hilarious and it's just beautifully, beautifully written. The language is beautifully manipulated. Dickens is a simple joy to read. If I were to give everybody in the world the exact same book, what would I give them? I have no idea. <laughs> I think it would be really hard. But there you go. Uh, Yellow Book of Flood. I think you should all consider giving each other books for Christmas Eve so everybody has an excuse to sit up late until they pass out because they want their gifts so badly and do that. Meanwhile, oh, COVID vaccine. I am grateful today. I woke up sick. So my voice may sound a little different. And I tested myself and I'm negative. And so it just feels like it's a bad cold. I'm getting the occasional shivers and I'm getting cold easily. So I'm spending my day just staying warm. I was having shivers yesterday and I wondered about it. Uh, basically, I've got a cough. It's kind of chesty. So you can pretty much guess that what I'm really doing today is drinking a lot of fluids, taking liquid electrolytes, and taking it easy. Let's see what else is going on. Oh, yeah. Well, anybody, please. You know what I'm really happy about today? Seriously, I'm really happy that I got a flu shot and a COVID shot. Really, really happy. I know at least two people who got COVID through their shots. I'm really sorry. So far, so good, kids. Please go get your shots. If you're in California, many healthcare insurers will give you COVID tests for free, including at-home tests. So, you know, there's really no excuse. Don't get it. If you get it, get treatment fast. What's on my hooks and needles? Well, I haven't finished anything this week, but I'm a really happy camper, partly because the reduction in class load in ASL is allowing me to knit and crochet, and my hands are not as sore anymore. So that's a good thing. So what have I been doing? Well, I've been ignoring the lane splitter skirt, although I did locate it, which is good. The don't know yet is going like a house on fire. It's true, it's December 5th, three more days, and I'm done knitting blocks, except I'm already done. I could tell you right now I've got more than enough. But I said knitting blocks. Yes, I'm crocheting the blocks, and I'm not going to edit that out. But number one, I now know the ASL word for crochet. I suspect most ASL speakers, including the deaf, don't know it. It's kind of an esoteric word. But also, apart from that, I am crocheting these blocks. I'm sure I have at least 100 blah, blah, blah. I'm sure I have at least 342 squares. I'm sure at this point. And so meanwhile, I'm way into it. Every day, I try to seam the short sides. Well, the blocks are five by five. I try to do a, a five inch seam every day on one of the rows I've clipped together. So far, I have rows one through three clipped together and row 19 because it's a frame. So it's just all going to be the same color. And so every day, if I want to, I can do a few of those puppies or even one and know that I'm doing well. In the meantime, I am now doing the long seam that joins row one, the very bottom of the black frame, to row two. And row three, I have not finished doing all the short seams. 
And so that's good. I want to finish sewing together the short seams on the sides of row three so that all row three is one solid piece and then clip it to the long rows one and two that are joined together. So I want to finish joining one and two. And I don't do a whole long seam every day, as you can tell. I probably could. But instead, I just take as long a piece of the yarn that I'm using for seaming as I feel comfortable with. And I will seam until I run out of that piece of yarn. So it looks like it's taking me like six or seven times of doing that to get the entire row done. Additionally, I'm looking at it and thinking, probably before I seam row three to the joint rows one and two, I'm going to try and weave in the ends because this it could be an end weaving nightmare. I do not want this giant finished quilt with five million ends sticking out. It's probably going to be easier just to weave in ends as I go along. So all of that should tell you there's a good picture in the show notes where you can see the first three rows. They look very strange because what I'm doing is I'm moving through the color progression as I set it up from coldest to warmest. But I'm trying to make it look like there's sort of darkness at the bottom of the panel of the entire finished object, that is, and that it's moving into lightness, and I'm hoping it's going to come out looking like a sunrise over a green meadow emerging from shadow or a sunset over it. That's kind of the bigger picture because it's going to be irregular, so I will be shaping it that way, which means... I can only do so many rows before I have to lay the entire thing out on the living room floor when the boys are far from home and the animals are locked outside and Minerva is locked in the study. And I have to lay everything out and take a picture and then start working on clipping it together. So there's going to be some horrific day, probably during Romeo, where I just stay on my hands and knees on the floor for an hour or two trying to make that happen. You can tell right away the advantages I've got of just doing the base level rows where it's pretty straightforward. I'm running out of colors, which is what is supposed to happen. I want to use up all the colors. I have way more light orange toned and yellow toned blocks than I have of anything else. So I'm really intent on using up the non-orange and yellow toned because I know I've got extras of the bright stuff. So there you go. That's a strange way to describe my logic, but thank you for trying to follow along. No love for the Pennsylvania Dutch embroidery. No love for the wrapped in tiny chains. But oh la, the Lady Eleanor Shaw. I found all my instructions, which is nice. It's supposed to be, I think, 35 rows of blocks. My guess is I've got about 17 rows. I am finishing skein six of 12. I thought I had only 11 skeins. The instructions do call for 12 in Corian. Turns out I have 12. I counted what I had and said, wow, I didn't realize that. So I'm really, really happy. The Lady Eleanor is going to come out to a very long length, which is what I want. It's meant to be a very big, very heavy, very long, very wide shawl. It's breathtaking. It's really just breathtaking. I do have to wash and block it for the simple reason that this yarn blooms, and it's going to need to. It's a little bit gappy looking. I have to tell you, when you have this much of anything, the gaps don't matter. That in other words, this shawl is so big and so dense and so heavy, but still I'd like to see the yarn bloom. Meanwhile, there is the Romule sweater. That Romule 2022, I have all the yarns picked out and I have several books with Fair Isle motifs and so I'm looking forward to throwing myself into that. And last week I told you, or in episode 106 I told you, that I'd like to have a knit along on Romule sweaters. So today I sat down and said, what would the rules of a cognitive podcast Romule knit along look like? And you can see the 10 rules in my show notes. And here's how they go. Since I am at December 5th, I'm going to say, start anytime you want, but you must cast on before 12.01 a.m. on December 25th. So in other words, it's cast on time, kids. Whatever else you want to do before December 25th, I'm fine with. If you knit this week and finish it, but you should listen to the rest of the rules. So rule number one, start anytime before December 25th. What does start mean? I don't know. Pick your colors, pull out a pattern, do a lot of planning, whatever. 
Rule number two, donate some old woolen stuff to a shelter. Come on, like me, you know, you've got extra sweaters that you wouldn't let the dog wear. And it's true. Actually, one of mine got moth, though. I'm trying to think if I have any sweaters of my own. Well, okay, but I do have extra woolens, and that's the thing. Rule number two, donate some old woolens that you've made to a shelter. Shelters always need socks, always. Shelters often need hats. An old sweater won't go amiss. Donate old woolens to a shelter. After all, this is Rome Yule. We're celebrating the quiet time between Christmas and New Year. But remember, poor families and homeless people, and I'm ashamed to say my country has homeless people, but we do. I'm ashamed to say we have poverty, but we do. They need warm things. So please donate your stuff. Remember, too, we make long-lasting things. We're makers. That's our pride and joy. We don't go to Walmart and buy fast fashion unless we have to. So, you know, the real joy of everything we make is it is meant to go on and on unless the moths get it and to keep people warm and happy. So rule number two of the Romeo K-A-L, cow, <laughs> the Romeo cow, <laughs> donate some of your old woolens to a shelter. If you have scraps from your Romeo that you make during this cow, hey, you know what? Make them into hats, make them into baby hats. Donate, donate, donate. Get rid of your scraps. Rule number three, make your Romeo sweater from your leftovers. I interpret this pretty loosely. If you say, well, I've got all these yarns that I want to make into a sweater, I'd say, okay, then somewhere in the color work, use one of your yarn scraps. That will get you into this. But the real spirit of my Romeo is all scraps, all leftovers, all weird oddball skeins. That includes my hand spun. Anything that you haven't put into a sweater that you could put into this, Go for it. Rule number four, drink a lot of really good tea and eat really good food. That includes leftovers. This is a time of rest and thanksgiving. Nothing says rest and thanksgiving like good tea and good food. Rule number five, you should try to finish early in the new year because this is a way of refreshing yourself and moving on. And so we want to use up our scraps instead of buying new things. We want to really enjoy the wealth that we already have to end this year. Okay, so meanwhile, back at the rule, rule number five. So meanwhile, just finish it and get rid of all that stuff out of your stash. This is going to feel so great. And I don't care when you finish it, but I'd say try to finish early in the new year. What does that mean? Well, early in the new year, let me think, the first quarter ends March 31st, 2023. Try to finish by then, okay? Rule number six of the Romeo Cow. Spend time with friends. Zoom and Skype and talk to people you haven't talked to face-to-face -face if you can. Talk to all those people you haven't talked to in a while. Catch up with old friends. That's rule number six. Rule number seven. Use any sweater pattern you want. Make up a sweater pattern. Don't put sleeves on your sweater. Use cap sleeves, use half sleeves, use wrist length sleeves. I don't care. Use any pattern you like. Experiment with a type or strategy that you've always wanted to try. My green Romeo last year, I just got out Mucklestone's book on fair isle motifs and just did little tiny ones across what really became the yoke of it. It was just a lighter color, pale blue green, and it just looked like this bland kind of band sitting there. And I said, oh, no. And so I tried incorporating some simple Fair Isle motifs. I'm extremely happy with it. Rule number eight, deck the halls. Deck the halls with boughs of holly or deck them with anything you want. But in between your Rome rule, remember to get up and do a little decorating and bring a little spirit into your house, whether it's Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Yule, or Christmas, or Diwali, any of the festivals of light, it's time to deck the halls. Rule number nine, please give a donation to the homeless. I have a $5 minimum because I recognize not everybody listening to this may be an adult. Not everybody may have independent income or income they can spare. But try to give a small amount to a homeless charity. Rule number 10, fa la 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 la, la 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 la. Fa la 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 la. Okay, so there are the 10 rules. One, start your project anytime from now through 
midnight, December 24th. So get it going. What does start it mean? Anything you want. Plan it, cast on, I don't care. Rule number two, donate some old woolens to a shelter, or you could donate any remaining yarn to a shelter. You could give it to a nursing home where they could knit with it, or you could make some preemie hats or some hats or some scrap socks or whatever, but use up your woolens and give what you make them into to a shelter. Rule number three, make your sweater from your leftovers. Rule number four, drink good tea and eat good food, preferably with friends. Rule number five, finish your project early in the new year. I don't know, by March 31st. Rule number six, spend time with your friends. Catch up with people you love. Rule number seven, use any old pattern you want to. Just make a sweater out of your leftovers. Rule number eight, deck your halls. Remember that it's not just about whatever you're making in this knit along. It's also about making your world merry and bright. Rule number nine, give a small donation of cash to the homeless. Either hand it to them on the street, make them sandwiches and hand them food, buy them a meal when you're in the parking lot of like Subway, whatever, but give some money somehow to the homeless. Rule number 10, fa la 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 la. There you go. My favorite resources, they are listed. You can read them there. Dizzy Blondes, I continue to spin a fuzzball of Minerva daily, one per day. This really takes about maybe five minutes to brush her and maybe a minute and a half to spin what I empty out of the small brush. Oh, let's see, let's see. I'm not spinning anything to ply against that right now. I've got that huge roll of the silk from the silk hankies that were generously donated to me by Redfish Dye Works. So right now I'm just accumulating Minerva. Let's get on to a strategy, shall we? Okay, on the interpersonal strategies, we've been working on Dear Man, and we are at last to the end of man, the very last thing. N is for negotiate. I've said it before and I'll say it again. People ask for things, and in their mind it's a yes, no thing. Yes, you're going to give me what I ask for. No, you're not going to give it to me. No, folks, no, that's not how the real world works. You have to be ready whenever you ask somebody to give you something or to do something for you or with you. You have to realize they may have a very different take on what you want. That's why you're listening to me, right? Because you feel like you don't know how to get what you want when you ask? Yeah. So what does that tell you? It tells you what you want is not necessarily what the other person is willing to give. So inherent in the idea of asking for what you want is the idea you may have to negotiate. And if you're using these tips, if you're using the acronym Dear Man, it's understood in this acronym that you're talking to the person with respect and you're rewarding them for their participation, which means you're inviting them to think about your request and to respond in an intelligent way so you're going probably to have to negotiate. One thing that should warn you is about your planning stage. You need to think about that. When you're thinking about asking somebody for something, the easy thing is to say, what will I do if they say no? Oh, no, 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 that's kind of simplistic. If they say no, you're going to try and maintain respect and politeness and be rewarding because you still need their help in other ways. But that's the easy answer. What will you do if they say, I've thought about that and I have this other solution or I've thought about that and I like your ideas some, but I want to kind of tweak them a bit. Or I've thought about that, and the answer is no. And here is my long and windy explanation of why. You can get through that and still negotiate, even if they're convinced they're going to turn you down. So if you want to get anything, you have to incorporate the idea of negotiation. To do that, we're back at plan ahead. Try to list every possible negotiation you can think of. You don't want to get blindsided. So you have to really think about not looking at your request in terms of a straight up yes or no, not using just black and white thinking, you give it to me or you don't. Now, when you're doing negotiation, negotiation also means losing gracefully. So the person just says flat out, you can't have what you want from them. They think about it, they sound very reasonable, and you realize you're not going to get what you want. Negotiation is not over. Negotiation now is planning for the future with this person. 
So you have to walk away calmly and kindly if you can. So part of negotiation is learning how to say, well, okay, I tried, but I see I'm not going to get that. But I want you to realize that I value working with you and I'm glad we're on the same team. I just think we may not see eye to eye on this one, but it doesn't change the fact I really like working with you. You have to learn to negotiate and you have to consider part of negotiation is the graceful loss. Why? Because we're talking about ongoing relationships most of the time. You don't want to get known as the person who can't lose or who can't accept defeat. Remember, negotiation is for the long term, not just this thing you're asking for, but things you might ask for in the future. If the person you're requesting something from says no, Remember, you can actually use that later. So the next time you make a request, you say, I want such and such, and they say no. And you say, you know, last time I asked you for something, you said no. And I feel like I'm getting a lot of no from you. I really feel like we should look at that. Maybe we should talk about more ways we can meet in the middle. So down the road, you might be using this very loss, if it is a loss, to negotiate further or to soften up the person who has what you want. So N is for negotiate. Negotiate means in the moment you're able to gracefully work with what the other person suggests or proposes. That means that you have planned in advance. You have thought about what do I want? What am I willing to take? What are all the possible options? What might the other person do to get me away from what I want? Or what might they blindside or surprise me with? Okay, so negotiation is not just in the moment. It's also part of the prep work. What would I accept if I don't get what I want? Moving on to the fluffy books. Let's see, I'm still cranking through Brazen Curiosity series, the Beatrice Hyde Clare series. Right now, I am on a nefarious establishment, I believe. I am stuck on death again because I just haven't been reading it because I'm really wasting my time with Beatrice Hyde Clare and really enjoying it. I am also listening to A Court of Thorn and Roses, and my jury is still out on that one. It does sound a bit like a Mary Sue, but the author is trying, and apparently this series gets very good as it progresses. I'm interested. I can't say I'm enthralled, but I'm in early days here. I also watched... Bridgerton. Now, I always swore I wouldn't get involved in Bridgerton. When you do an experiment where you integrate a cast the way they have in Bridgerton to talk about a historical period that did not support cultural or racial integration, what I get worried about is that we're whitewashing. I get worried that we're just saying, if I say we meaning white people in this one, We're just saying, hey, black people, look, there you are. You can wear our fancy clothes and you can play the game. So just forget that in the Regency period, the aristocracy, even though they banned slavery in Great Britain, they were relying on it financially to keep the plantations going in the West Indies and Jamaica. And that's the source of much of the wealth in Regency Great Britain. Yeah. And so, you know, to me, if you... If you say, well, we integrate the cast, that's great, except that now you sort of run the risk that it looks like your characters are unbelievably cold, that the British African characters are sort of saying, we don't care about the exploitation of our people. Uh, Yeah, and it looks like the white creators, if they are white, are saying, let's just see if we can make those uncomfortable moments of history go away. That's what kind of worries me. I was told Bridgerton was different. Yeah, uh, it tries to take on some of the issues. The problem with Bridgerton, first of all, it's very 21st century. They even play Material Girl in the background in a Regency musical arrangement. They know they're doing this. They know they're not being historically accurate. They've already answered that a long time ago. The problem with Bridgerton for me is it almost, it almost gets intelligent, but it keeps resorting to these more simplistic models of girl and boy. Is it addictive? Yeah, it is. I mean, the plot, they, they keep you interested in the plot. 
There's not a lot new there. I think if I were to say, is there anything good about Bridgerton? It's the, yes, racial integration. That this is one of those moments of representation is everything. That it is remarkable when you see the cast and nobody's making any comments whatsoever about race. People are just completely seamlessly integrated into the culture. Yeah, you know what? That's a great thing. It's, it's a great thing. And you realize how few times it actually occurs in the media. So that's what I like about it. But there's a lot of problems with Bridgerton. So, you know, there's two seasons of it on Netflix. And I, I think it's something that wants to have some kind of social and cultural value. I don't think it makes it. You know, it's, it's a fun story, but again, you know, it's got the flaws that that genre can have, and I'm not going to go into that. Other people have done that better. Would I recommend Bridgerton? Not, not really. I don't really think it's a thinking person's show. I have to admit it. I'm watching it, or I watched it as empty-headed fluff. It almost has a discussion of marital rape. It almost does. You know, it's things like that where you just go, uh. I have to admit it, the things they get right, the sets are beautiful, the costumes are beautiful, the integration is beautiful. In the first season, they do try to talk about how that integration happened. They just don't have the guts to do it. I have no idea what the novelist who wrote the Bridgerton novels does. I don't plan to find out. Something I really like, The Advent Box by Pearly Shell Fiber Company. You can see a picture of the latest entry I have in the picture. It's a kind of group picture. And you can see the beautiful card with the alpaca wearing flowers on its head and the pearly shells postcard and the gnome ornament and the open box with the first four days of minis already showing. You can also see a picture of what it all looked like when I opened the box. I'm deeply enjoying opening one package per day. Today, I was on number five. I took a break because it's obviously all minis. So what I did instead was today I said, I'll take a break and instead highlight this adorable gnome ornament that is in the box to go on the tree. But I'm having a lot of fun. I've always wanted to do one of the advent boxes. I've always found them to be prohibitively expensive. But this year, I just felt like I have taken a lot of hits financially and in other things. And I thought, I want a present where I get to open something yarny every day. Let me tell you, my beloved spouse loves me and he gives me great Christmas presents, but only once has he ever given me yarn. He just avoids it. I don't know why. I'm fine with that. What it has taught me is at this time of year, I go looking for bargains and restock the house. And frankly, this year I bought myself a really nice yarny gift that is the Advent Box by Pearly Shell Fiber Company. Put a lid on it. Well, I got a little excited by tea. I go through phases where I give up all caffeine and then I readopt it. So I'm in the readoption phase now. And I decided it would be fun to just do tea tastings, to write up all the different teas I am experimenting with and to take pictures of them and to talk about them. If you want to see the tea write-ups, they are in Instagram. The hashtag is tea tasting Gemma. And if you follow me on social media, you'll be able to see these. I'm debating if I want to start an independent Instagram account just called tea tasting Gemma, just to collect all the tea tastings. I think it's really fun. People have suggested teas to me. Thank you very much. So today I did order from Harney and Sons Grace, which apparently is an Earl Grey with vanilla in it, and also Harney and Sons Hot Cinnamon Spice. I already have their Hot Apple Spice, and we'll review it soon. So I'm looking forward to this, but I keep buying these little tiny samples of tea. I'm also trying to sample commercial teas, so there is one tea sampling of Stash Lemon Ginger, and there's also a Republic of Tea sampling. It's been an awful lot of fun. So if you'd like to see the tea tastings, you can see four of them on the page on the show notes for episode 107, this very episode. The Blather, ASL, oh, the final was easy. I have one last piece of it. In a few nights, I have to talk to my teacher online in ASL for 15 minutes. I don't know what that'll be like, but nothing else has been very hard. 
So I'm just kind of okay with it. It makes me nervous, but I'm just going to march through it. I got through the session where she and I talked individually about my story, and I just had so much fun with that. And so that's all that's left. I am signed up for ASL 102. It's going to be very hard to take because it's Monday and Wednesday nights at 5 p.m. So what I'm going to do to get from work to that, because I work until 5 and sometimes a few minutes afterwards, I'm not sure. So we'll see if that works out. I hope it does. The pup date. Captain decided she likes sleeping on the big bed. To my shock, my husband came in and slept with us, and we all somehow fit. Captain is easily 70 pounds and very big, so she takes up a lot of the bed. The very adorable thing, she likes the temperature blanket from last year. So does Minerva. If I give them their choice, they will lie on the temperature blanket. I'm not sure why they like lying on acrylic. Captain got very hot the other night and was happy to get off the bed. You could see that the acrylic was not circulating air under her very well. Also, it's always going to be cooler by the floor, you know, basic air, current flow. But anyway, yes, Captain has taken to lying on the bed at night, and apparently we all fit in the bed, so everything is good. The hub's date, to be brief, all is doing well. He's fine. Nothing else has flared up. We seem... You know, touch wood, it feels like we're getting past that problem with his eyes. The bad news, yesterday got rear-ended in the Trader Joe's parking lot, went out, saw my car before I left, remember it looked normal, came back, big chunk of the fender is pushed in above the bumper. So my husband is doing the insurance shuffle on that today. Meanwhile, on the calendar, the Romeo break is scheduled for December. Well, officially it starts at midnight on Christmas Eve, but I have December 26th to 31st. To be honest, I will be off December 25th through January 2nd. I am really looking forward to that. The Grand Canyon is on the calendar for June 5th through 9th, 2023. Sunnybank is on the calendar for August 17th through 21st, 2023. And many thanks, warm thanks to its friend, by the way, who sent me a beautiful pattern called Foxtrot on Ravelry and said you could use this to make your next collie thing. I think it's a great idea. I probably will. Meanwhile, Minerva gets the last word. Well, to Minerva, I am playing cruel games right now because there are ornaments all over the house. Like she keeps knocking off the tree, and so we're moving the ornaments up the tree where she can't reach them. String everywhere. She's not allowed to be alone in the room with string. Yarn everywhere, including loose ends on my blankets. It's just plain cruel. So if you would like to see Minerva's response, you can see her staring out the window at the rain yesterday. What she is really doing while she is staring out, she is refusing to acknowledge my existence because the room is just full of cat toys and I won't let her play with any of them. And so I think that's really it. I, but in the meantime, this is a really short one. I've been talking fast. I had some caffeine, you know. But at any rate, I'm really glad to have talked to you today. It's beautiful. It's gray and overcast here. It has been for a few days. It's only in the low 50s. It's very cool and relaxed and mellow. And my Monday off is drawing to an end. And I'm starting to do all the things I need to do to prep for tomorrow's work day. And I still have to study a lot of ASL. So I'm off to do all those things. Everybody remember COVID is on the rise. If you're in LA County, they're looking at masking again, unfortunately, indoors. So please get your shots, get everybody to get their shots, wear your mask, socially distance, wash your hands, which is a big one. Most of all, remember, we're a community. We sink or swim together. So we're all going to try and get ourselves through our flu and cold season as well. So that mask is a good idea. Small joy. While I'm sitting here sick, I'm thinking I was in Trader Joe's yesterday and I wore a mask. And I'm so grateful because I'm really uncomfortably sick today. And it makes me extremely happy to think whatever I did yesterday, I did not consciously or unconsciously, as far as I can tell, pass on whatever I am sick from today. So I'm really happy with myself. I feel like that was some good communal behavior. It's easy to keep it focused on COVID. But remember, at this time of year, it's about colds and flu as well. So everybody, there you go. Please, everybody, thank you for listening. Please keep sending in the comments. And remember, everybody, stay safe, take care of each other, 
and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.